We'll ask you to stand once again as we sing our last song before uh, Brother Johnson comes to teach the word. We'll sing 414, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? 414, we'll sing all four verses, one through four. Am I a soldier of the cross? Open my eyes. Well, I say open our eyes. Uh, but thinking about vision, both literally and figuratively, what's the value of vision? Well, if I didn't have my vision, I wouldn't be able to read my notes off this page here. So that's very helpful for that. Uh, in fact, just any, ask any ophthalmologist what the value of clear vision is, and they'll try to sell you, of course, on their solution. Uh, and so... Obviously, vision, good vision is very important, and uh, for my mother, uh, that's especially true. Uh, in realizing the value of that, uh, she lost most of what vision she had at an early age, and has she's had surgeries and various procedures since then to help to try to restore some of that vision, uh, but she lives even to this day legally blind, so... You know, if you ask her about what the value of clear vision is, then I, I think that she would say a hearty amen to say that, hey, that's a very important thing. What about spiritually? If you think about our, our spiritual vision, just like there's the verse in the Psalms, open mine eyes that I open thou mine eyes that I might see wondrous things in thy law. Uh, do we see clearly the word of God when we read it, when we study it? And hopefully through tonight's study, we'll be able to have a clear vision, I hope, of some of the attributes of God as we see it in our passage here tonight in 2 Kings chapter 6. So looking at that, uh, before I get into the actual study tonight, I'll go ahead and have another word of prayer, and then we'll look at the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to stand in this pulpit and to be able to, to lead these people in this Bible study, and I just pray for your Holy Spirit now uh, to give me a piece about the words that I should say. Uh, to remind me of things, Lord, which uh, uh, which came to me as I was studying your word. Things, Lord, which uh, I pray by your direction as I speak them would be helpful to those who hear. And just pray for your Holy Spirit to do his work in each of our hearts tonight, that you would, as we're led and guided into all truth, that you would help as we grow in that grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, just do that work tonight, I pray through this. In Jesus' name, amen. Open their eyes. So our next study in the life of Elisha is I've had an opportunity now to have, I've, I kind of lost track. I think this might be number six, but I could be wrong. But we had a number of times to be able to look at Elisha himself. Now, of course, Elijah was very important. There were a number of studies that we did uh, with him. But Elisha, uh, the one who asked for the double blessed, the double portion, uh, and some would say that a lot of what happens in his ministry is uh, effectually seeing that double portion that was given to him of the uh, ministry of Elijah. And so looking at him tonight, first thing I want to look at that I want us to be able to see as we open our eyes to the Word of God tonight, chapter, again, uh, 2 Kings chapter 6 there, I want us to see the axe head. So we'll get into that as we read here and understand what that means. And I believe through this portion we see a picture of God's provision so, starting there, verse number 1 as we read, 2 Kings chapter 6. 
And the sons of the prophet said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So we see there this school of prophets. They had a they had some growing pains, I suppose, as their, their numbers grew and they found that their living quarters were not sufficient for the number of people that were there. Everyone elbow against elbow. Um, in fact, I even saw something about uh, living in a World War II submarine recently and how some of them had to get packed in sometimes in some of their living quarters. I mean, even today on some of our nuclear submarines that we have, it's pretty tight quarters, but they had the opportunity to be able to expand. And so just like Brother Patton, who we prayed for, they went to go through with this uh, building project, if you will. And so they say, all right, well, let's just go. Let's cut us down some wood and we'll see if we can build us a new place that we can go to live. And that's uh, another thing I like to see kind of a little aside to this. Looking at verse number two, they're seeing the cooperation that they had uh, and seeing every, and every man a beam. So every person had his own responsibility, his own portion of the duty that he was supposed to do, kind of like with Nehemiah, and everyone had their responsibilities there as they were working to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. So how does that apply to us? Well, thinking about First Baptist Church of Westminster, well, uh, we've prayed even recently about opportunities we might have to expand and to uh, be able to do greater things through our ministry here. Uh, and and part of that being with the building that we've been so blessed with. Uh, and of course, with the, we're talking about how many people we had a couple weeks ago for our Resurrection Sunday service. It, it has the appearance, and even not only numerically, but spiritually, that things are growing. And so very thankful for that. But, you know, we too, like them, may run into some of these growing pains. And we need to uh, be able to navigate that uh, in a wise way. Uh, so they're continuing here as they try to begin this building program now. Well, where were they? Well, where was this? Well, if you go back to 2 Kings chapter 2, there's perhaps a number of places that uh, this particular place they came from might have been. Uh, now they talk about here going to the Jordan, the Jordan River. And so nearby to that would be Jericho of the places at least listed in 2 Kings chapter 2. So that's a plausible place, I think, maybe that this particular group might have been located. So trying to expand and having the, the access to the wood there, they were going to go to the Jordan River and try to get themselves some materials to be able to be able to grow uh, and build a place where they could have all the prophets continue to live. So then they also convinced Elisha to join them. And so Elisha was there willing to go along with it. So... Uh, continuing on there in verse number four, it says, So he, Elisha, went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Well, so in the process of this building program, they ran into this little issue. And so this one poor feller here was trying to fell this tree. Uh, feller felling a tree. Anyhow... The, so the, whatever he was doing to try to chop down that tree, he lost the head to his axe, and it, lo and behold, ended up uh, evidently in the Jordan River. And so a problem for a number of reasons. I mean, you can imagine, say, you have one of your power tools, uh, and you have something go wrong with one of your power tools. You know, you, that's a problem. So if you're on a construction project, anytime you have that kind of a thing happen, it's the, an issue that you have to solve. Well, so then he says specifically there, for it was borrowed. Well, I mean, think to yourself, if you were trying to work on some kind of a construction project on your own house, I'm, I, I'm not terribly handy, and I don't have power tools, so I just use whatever I can uh, whenever I try to do something. But uh, uh, other people are more blessed to have uh, more power tools at their disposal. Uh, so I would be one in a position of needing to borrow, say, from Pastor Larson or anyone else here who I know has power tools uh, to be able to do something with my project. Now, how would I feel if, say, I borrowed something from using Pastor Larson as an example? He lets me borrow his router or his jigsaw or whatever, and for some reason, 
you know, something goes wrong with that. I, I, I break it, I lose it, uh, I let it sit around somewhere, someone comes and steals it. Uh, from a practical standpoint, if that happened, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a burden to deal with. That I have to, how, how do I replace this now? What, what am I going to tell Brother Larson about his tool now? Uh, he's he's going to come after me for that. So that, that's, a, that's a problem. That's an issue. And so here with the axe being borrowed, I mean, even from a practical standpoint, you could see his perhaps mental anguish over the fact that something happened to this tool that he borrowed. Now, so I was trying to see if there was something maybe in their law that talked and, and referred to something like this. I, I don't know that this would be a direct comparison, but uh, in Exodus chapter 22 uh, the, the context of that dealt more with thieves coming and stealing things and making restitution. Uh, but there's some verses in there that talk to that effect about uh, even the very fact that any piece of property you might have loaned to somebody uh, that uh, for some reason that was lost and yet you went to the courts to try to deal with it, then they, they were going to hold, they were going to try to figure out who was accountable for that. And whoever was accountable to that would then have to pay double for it. So, I, I mean, I can't help but think if maybe that was on his mind and he was thinking to himself, I'm not going to have to restore it. I might have to restore it double, you know, whatever this was worth. So the, the fact that he, this axe head broke, uh, not only might have been a mark on his integrity, but also uh, just financially because now he might have to repay even more and he might not be in a financial position to do that. I mean, he's one of these sons of the prophets and I, I don't imagine them as being very rich people. You know, it's not like you can just go to Ace Hardware or Home Depot. And, oh, let me go pick up a new axe head here, and uh, I'll, I'll get it all straightened away. But, uh, you know, that's what we do nowadays. And whatever Pastor Larson's tool is, I would just go and replace it probably, you know, and apologize profusely, of course. But uh, so trying to, trying to solve this issue now. They have this problem in their wood cutting for uh, felling the beams for building this new place for the prophets to live. So what ended up being the solution here? So verse number six, it says, And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick, and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. So again, thinking practically, if you were to have lost something like that in, say, a flowing body of water like the Jordan River, uh, practically speaking, and in something like an axe head, maybe you could just kind of crawl in the water and uh, maybe go fetch it, retrieve it somehow, uh, possibly. I don't know. And See, I don't know what the condition of the Jordan River was at the time of uh, this taking place. So, I mean, this could be... Uh, like when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River and Jordan was overflowing his banks. You know, that you could have like a, a rushing, you know, think of the Mississippi River flowing over its banks. And even some 30 years ago, the flooding that happened as a result of that, not to mention any other flood since then in other places. So if you're dealing with water like that, maybe then it's not so practical to just kind of hop in and, you know, because if it's, if it's just clear water, you know, and it's just just kind of lightly kind of trotting along there, you could just maybe reach down and pick it up. I don't know how deep it is either. So again, the practical prospect of getting this, uh, I, is it possible? Maybe, depending on the circumstances, but God chooses to do this in a miraculous way to restore this ax head. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I've never seen an ax head swim. So I, that must have been quite a sight to see. I don't know, was it doing like breast strokes or something, you know, back, you know, back strokes? I don't know. It said it was swimming there, but uh, you know, I mean, sure, we have iron swimming in the sense that people built ironclad ships. So yeah, I mean, yeah, iron can swim if you give it a buoyancy, but you know, with an axe head, that's not going to happen. So this was a miracle, the fact that this axe head was floating on the water here. So why would God do something like this, you know, what, and what's the picture for us? Uh, so I, I talk about this being a picture of God's provision. You know, sometimes there are situations we get ourselves into where, I mean, yeah, humanly speaking, we could probably dig ourselves out, whether it be a financial situation, a relationship situation, something else where we can maybe take care of it ourselves. But sometimes God just likes to show himself to be God. And in our lives, when we're in some of these situations, 
God is there, that, that still small voice saying, hey, I can provide for this need for you. So why don't you let me try to provide that need for you? And so God here is providing the need of, hey, he's, think of how thrilled he's going to be when he sees that axe head again. I thought that thing was lost. You know, and I have a bad habit of losing things sometimes. So, I mean, think about the woman who had to sweep her house to find the silver coin and other things like that. You know, the joy that he would feel over being able to have the axe head restored. But just like with him, same with us. God wants to be able to to show himself to be God in our lives. He wants that opportunity for us to let him do that. And so that's my encouragement to you as we look at seeing the axe head. So second thing I want to look at tonight in the next verses there is to see the Syrian camp. And the Syrians were a little bit of a thorn sometimes uh, in the nation of Israel and even the southern kingdom of Judah later on. Uh, But this is some of the beginnings of some of that conflict here that we see uh, in 2 Kings chapter 6 as we continue to read. And I believe through this portion in these next few verses, we're going to see a picture of God's direction. Verse number 8, it says, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him of and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. So many times is the implication there that he was able to evade them. So we'll get into the reaction of the Syrians in a moment here, but thinking about the fact that Uh, Elisha has this special intel now. I mean, how would you like to have that kind of reconnaissance uh, in thinking about some of the situations that you navigate even just in your daily life? Uh, I mean, not even to mention a wartime situation where that's critical information to have, to know where your enemy is, what their strength is, if you're going to be able to overcome them with what you have. Uh, So uh, what's going on here? So Elisha, Elisha somehow... And I say somehow in really big quotes, because God's the one that's giving them that information. And Elisha is allowing them the opportunity to be able to uh, know where the Syrians are so that they can prepare for it and escape any damage to their armies. And and so uh, Jehoram, who's the king here at the time for the northern kingdom, uh, takes that advice to heart and actually does intervene in saving his troops here as they uh, navigate this conflict here. So continuing on here, as we see the reaction now of the king of Syria, it says in verse 11, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which, which is for us and for the, which, it, sorry, will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Well, so interesting that they, um, I, don't want, I don't know that they knew that directly by observing Elisha, because we don't really see them spying on him until the next verse. But I believe this person had an idea of the reputation of Elisha, knew enough about him to know that he had this kind of a relationship with his God, and that these kinds of things for Elisha were pretty normal. And so for this to happen, then uh, I guess no big surprise, but at the the same time, kind of frustrating because here you are trying to plan your battle and it seems like every move you make, they're able to counter you somehow. It's like, how in the world is this happening? You know, sometimes in my life, I'd love to have a little bit of uh, foresight to be able to know things that are, that are coming, uh, spoil the plans of the enemy, which, uh, Again, an application of that, perhaps. But, hey, uh, spoiler also. Hey, God do- does give us a little bit of insight here to know some of the things that are to come. Gives us some preparation for knowing how to deal with our lives uh, in a certain way. And uh, just like we've been told about uh, being wary of, of Satan and his devices, uh, God has told us certain things to be warned of. And so it would be good for us to be able to take heed then to those things. So, again, 
this is, uh, I believe, a picture of how God can direct us. If we take the information that he's giving us, just like Elisha was giving the king there information about the battle plans, hey, God is giving us some insight too to know how to uh, navigate our lives so that we, uh, I mean, we, I, I wish I knew everything, but I don't. Uh, and I, that's becoming more and more evident every time I open my mouth. But uh, I like the fact that God has given us something to go by here that we can take, that we can rely on, that we can then have an idea of what's coming. And then we can have that kind of an advantage against the enemy that comes against us. So we've seen God's direction through the Syrian camp here. The next thing here I'd like to look at is to see the army of heaven. Continuing on in verse number 13. And he said, go and spy where he is, talking about Elisha, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. So, again, they kind of suspected that it was Elisha here, and so they went out to go and find him. All right, well, we got to take away this advantage that they have now. So now they send out their spies, they go and they find Elisha, and they find out that he's in Dothan. And so then they have this little secret mission with these, this, it says a great host here in verse 14. I don't, I don't think he wanted any chance for Elisha to escape. But then again, there's kind of an ar- irony in that too. I mean, Elisha has already been privy to all their secret plans. So the fact that they're coming to try to surround him in the middle of the night, I don't know how well that's going to work. Uh, given the history that Elisha's had already with, again, knowing their plans. So yeah. so when he says great host here, think of, think of him sending the big guns. You know, w- when you want to really tackle an enemy, you want to, to send out your big guns to be able to uh, conquer and have the advantage. Well, so that's what they do here in verse 14. Uh, so they surround the city of Dothan here. And so now we see, uh, again, the reaction now, verse 15, as we continue. When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So this poor servant wakes up now this morning, and he looks out around the city, and something's not right, obviously, because now there's a whole army that's surrounding your city. That's a problem. Uh, So... And them just being two mere humans, of course, you know, they don't stand a chance against a whole army if they're going to try to fight back, which, of course, they won't. But uh, this, he didn't see any way for this to be overcome. And so he's in this state of panic now, a state of fear, because he sees this great army coming against them, and he doesn't know what to do. So you know, turning to Elisha, hey, what, you, what are we going to do now, master? Well, and in, it, I can almost see Elisha saying this just in a, in a calm kind of voice because, I mean, Elisha, it always seemed like because of his relationship with the Lord was in control of uh, those situations because the Lord was on his side and knew that and acknowledged that and lived that out. And so he encourages him, hey, don't worry about this. We, we've got a, a, an ace up the sleeve, as it were. Uh, and so then giving him this special insight, and again, this is another situation where, boy, I wish I had that kind of vision to be able to see this kind of thing. It isn't the first time uh, that something like this has been disclosed, but uh, for the sake of the servant now, he's allowing him to be able to see the spiritual battle that's happening around him. Uh, and that's, that's comforting to know. I mean, we, we with our human eyes, We see each other, we see uh, the problems that we have, we see the trials that we go through. There's a lot of things that our human eyes see, but one of the things our human eyes don't see is kind of what it talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, and talking about that spiritual battle, the principalities, the powers in high places, all of those things. But yet, hey, 
we have a great host on our side too. They were up against a great host. Well, <laughs> let, let me show you an even greater host now. I can almost see him singing now, uh, like the song. Open my eyes that I might see chariots of fire to fight for me, and then so on and so forth. I, I, I should make another verse to that song now. <laughs> so Elisha, again, realizing hey, this is okay. We've got this under control. God's got us protected. And that's the picture here, is to be able to see God's protection through the situation. And guess what? The, the Lord has your back. So don't worry about the situations that you go through uh, and seeing all of the difficulties around you. God has help on your side. Uh, think about other places where there's situations like that. I mean, Christ on the cross uh, could have had 12 legions of angels release him to set him free. He didn't because, I mean, he had, he had to go through that. Uh, other places too, like with Daniel. Daniel prayed and uh, had his answer sent to him uh, through an angel, and the angel talked about the battles that he had to go through to be able to get to him. Hey, so there's, there's God may not always answer on our timetable, but hey, God will answer uh will answer on his uh, schedule as long as we're, we have a right heart, then uh, God will allow us to be able to be blessed by that and partake of that. And so God here showing him that he can divinely protect him just like he can for us. As we go through our situations, God is there for us. And so finally tonight, now that we've seen all these things, we're going to see the king in Samaria, which... And this portion of scripture, I believe, gives us a picture of God's sovereignty. So now at this point, now that they've seen these chariots of fire and all the help that God has that's on their side, Elisha now continues on, verse 18. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, this is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. I almost sense a little bit of uh, 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 a little bit of a change to his voice there, as maybe he's saying some of those things. Uh, but really, in essence, in essence, saying there, let me show you who you really want to go see now. I, I believe that's kind of the sense of it. Uh, so the Lord allows these people to be smitten with blindness. And so now uh, leading these blind folk, who knows where, and uh, they don't know where they're going. You know, so they're going to go to, uh, it says he, in verse 19, he led them to Samaria. So they're coming from Dothan, which is about, about a dozen miles or so to the north of Samaria. I'm uh, going to pose a question maybe to our trailman here. How would you like to go on a 12-mile blind hike? No, yeah, that's what I thought. So imagine these guys now going on this 12-mile hike, blind, led by uh, Elisha and his servant there, uh, who, and whoever else might have been part of that entourage. Uh, so maybe, maybe a day or two's hike uh, from where they were. Uh, given the fact that they're blind, I imagine that they might be slowed down a little bit. I mean, they've, I've seen the trailmen do exercises before where they're trying to give voice commands to try to navigate through a maze and if they touch an obstacle, they have to start over, that kind of thing. So I can imagine this was probably a little bit uh, of a logistical challenge, trying to lead this blind army 12 miles through the wilderness to be able to get to Samaria here. And so what lies in Samaria but uh, the king of Israel himself, who uh, imagine a look on his face when he sees his enemies walking in blind into his courts there. So we're going to see that now. Uh, verse number 20. And it came to pass when they were come into Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And sorry, I don't have a verse for that one. Uh, that is a verse of a song that is. So don't expect me to sing again. So now the sense here of opening their eyes, they're, they're kind of seeing now what their predicament is. They thought they had the advantage in being the army that was surrounding him, trying to capture him, trying to control him. 
but now the tables have been turned and they're now seeing that they're the ones that are at the disadvantage because now, uh, I mean, what are you going to do? You're a whole bunch of subjects that are now surrounded by the opposing army. So what's, what's going to happen now? Well, I, I think they realize their position uh, and as surprised as they were, um, well, what could they do? So uh, continuing on here, verse 21 And the king of Israel said unto Elisha when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest uh, wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. And so the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel at least for now, because there's the rest of the story as you continue in that chapter. So king of Israel now probably very excited now the fact that, hey, he he can do whatever he wants to these people. And they're kind of at his mercy. And so he he asked this question to Elisha, hey, can I just kind of kind of off them? Can I can can I just get rid of my enemies here? Uh, leading me to the thought that perhaps this is more for the sake of protecting Israel rather than for disposing of their enemies. It's kind of another uh, aside there. Uh, but in, in thinking about this, he gives them the counsel instead, hey, let's, uh, let's do good to our enemies. Uh, and there's, there's a precedent for that in the New Testament too, where Jesus tells us about doing that. And sometimes that's a very disarming thing in its own right, too. Um, And I sometimes think about the the passage in Romans chapter 12 where it talks about um, uh, when you're doing good to your enemies, it kind of heaps coals of fire on their head kind of thing. Again, not really the main thought of this here, but uh, just kind of a random thought I had on the other side. But uh, this, uh, in seeing this done to them, I mean, they're already confused enough probably that, hey, we've already been led on this blind 12-mile hike, and now when we get into the enemy's court, they're going to feed us dinner. How does that work? I, I, don't, I don't understand. It shouldn't, shouldn't they? Wouldn't their expectation be that their lives were done for? Well, whereas instead now they're allowed to be able to eat and, they, and even be set free. Uh, but... Again, the fact that this was an army here, uh, the, the fact that they were treated to this kind of hospitality, I mean, how do you, how do you now turn on this uh, to be able to say, well, hey, we're, we're inside their territory. Can, can't we do something now? Well, I mean, they've been so hospitable to us. I mean, how, how do we turn on the people that just fed us? And so, you know, I can again imagine their confusion in all this situation. And so it says there that they, they went back to their... Uh, to their master here. And I believe, again, that goodness kind of disarmed them from really doing any harm to uh, Israel and their army. But God really was showing them there, I believe, the fact that he's the one that's in control. I mean, this army thought they were in control of the situation, and yet God, through Elisha, was showing them otherwise and making them realize, hey, you're not the top dogs here. I'm the one that's in control here. I'm going to show you who's the boss and so a good thing for us to keep in mind as we think about uh, our various situations, God's the one that's in control. Uh, and even like with other places in our study tonight and talking about, you know, is there something humanly that we can do? Well, we do have some human responsibility in certain things, but at the same time, let's let God be God and let him have the control and be uh, just in awe and let him be glorified for what he does and can do in and through our lives. So with that, I'll go ahead and end what I have to study here tonight. Next time I have the opportunity, we'll continue through chapter 6 there and look at what the rest of the fate of the host of Syria is. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we've had to study your word tonight. And uh, even, Lord, as uh, I mentioned the song and even in the title of the message, Lord, uh, and thinking about how our eyes also need to be open to the things that we see here in your word, I just again pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will continue to do whatever work needs to be done in each individual heart. Uh, As you, the God of all, know all, 
and are able to minister to the needs of each individual through this passage as, well, as you know best. And so, Lord, just do that work, and I pray for us as we go our separate ways tonight. I pray for any fellowship uh, that would happen after the service, and for your protection, Lord, and for your safety, and for good health as we go to our respective places. Uh, uh, Lord, thank you so much for who you are and for showing yourself, uh, I pray, through this study. And Lord, it's always good to see yourself revealed as we study your word. And so, Lord, just continue to be honored and glorified through that. And uh, thank you, Lord, for, again, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.